you might not be aware of it, but the passage that was read from Acts occurred fairly soon after Paul finished penning the book of Romans. And if you, if you have your Bible handy and you want to turn to chapter 15, it's an interesting picture that Paul paints here. <clears throat> he says, this is reading now towards the end of the book as he's getting ready to wrap it up. <clears throat> he said, um, verse 22, for which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. Well, actually, let me go ahead and read verse 21 just so there's a little context. But as written to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this cause I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire for these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey to Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for as pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, that's Asia, to make certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem, and hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duties also to minister unto them in carnal things. Wherefore, when I have performed this and sealed to them this fruit, I will come to you into Spain. I'll come by you into Spain. And I'm sure that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. But now I seat you, beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Then I may come unto you with the joy, with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now, if you finished, if you go back to the book of Acts and read the rest of it, he did go to Rome as a prisoner, um, a little different manner of entrance. So, perspective, we're talking about this practice of living together in the gospel in peace and if I might say um, here's an example of an attempt and a colossal failure at least in terms of the intent of the attempt so I, I recognize that we wouldn't be uh, wasting our time if we spent a few weeks just discussing this practical application. And as I prayed, there are two extremes in the nature of the application. And so I have six cases on the, on the screen that have the potential for being discussed. I, I, I think that in process of reality, um, we'll, we'll probably go through these in the context of some of the scripture, but um, I gave an illustration last week of the case, the case of the, the trash can stumble where a young believer was, uh, got a new job and happened to uh, be collect, collecting trash. And he hap his route happened to be on the route of one of the leaders of our church at that time. And the young lad had been saved very recently from the world, but part of that world for him was the alcoholism as a, as a teen in high school. And he had, in the process of emptying one of the leaders of our church trash can, found beer cans in the church leader's trash, which uh, alarmed him and it was, was a real struggle to him. And so I shared a little bit of um, my action on that. Um, it's probably important to put a little caveat in here at this point. 
When I try to remember the precise details of circumstances from the past, I, I need to be careful because I don't always have exact details. I do have clarity of focal point. And I remember my focal point was an absolute sense of concern for this young brother and the inadvertent um, potential for stumbling that was being created by uh, unbeknownst by this uh, leader in our church at the time. So when I confronted the leader, I confronted him. I was fairly young, don't forget. Uh, um, and yes, I was uh, attended towards strong manifestation, a strong presentation of my perspective. And I, I may have extended myself beyond what I should have, but there was a sense of no uncertainty that this occasion of stumbling could be allowed to continue, had to be remedied in a, in a, in a meaningful fashion um, for the sake of the gospel. Anyway, that was one case. There's a couple other cases that are listed here, but <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping it would be nice if we could continue some of this practical discussion this afternoon in our um, parenting session, but that would be sort of like usurping Josh's time, but we'll see how that works. Um, so Acts 21 here, case four, is what was read from the scripture, and I find it a very interesting case. I mean, the scripture gives the account, and it is what it is in terms of what happened. But if you look on the screen, case three, I titled the case of the Apostles' Feed. I know I'm trying to be a little catchy. Everybody knows the Apostles' Creed. Well, this was a case of the Apostles' Feed when Peter disassociated himself from the Gentiles when brothers from, from Jerusalem came. And in that disassociation uh, required a public rebuke by Paul. Paul, who was a lesser authority, and Peter from the standpoint of who was an apostle first. Quite a bit of information. So, but as I've gone on, I mean, there's so much information, and I, this is almost true. It might be an overstatement, but, but not much. If we don't get this part of the scripture, then we miss out on practical Christianity in our life. It's impossible to walk practically as a Christian. So, um, if you, since you have your Bibles open to Romans, if, if you look back to chapter 14, I love the King James because of how it describes it. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So there's something called doubtful disputations that is inappropriate counterproductive, harmful to the body of Christ. And so it's, it's, it's fair, it's fair to say that a doubtful disputation can be brought forward by anyone. Anyone can get into a controversy about a particular matter. And so engaging in that battle, having a battle out over a particular point of view is the danger, is the risk by which we are trying to establish what we believe is right and wrong as the primer, primary element of our fellowship one with another. So um, I, I do will, excuse me, I do desire to go through these more meaningfully, but what I want to do, I mean, there's so much scripture. I mean, I just, I've had so much fun meditating and preparing and I'm like, I can't believe it. I'll never get through half of what I'm talking about or thinking about. On the screen right now from Romans 14, um, here's what has to happen, okay? When, when you have a particular situation, you have to put it through some kind of a grid of process so that you're dealing with the right issue. Um, you know, it, it, I told you last week, it sounded like I was contradicting myself, that the manner of approach to interaction among ourselves is Matthew 18, which involves working through issues when there are issues that need to be worked through. And I also said that any necessary consequence that would need to be carried out in the end actually would be a situation where you would, if, something, if a matter couldn't be resolved in harmony and peace, you would separate and have uh, you know, distinctness between believers who simply cannot get along. So, 
I was, it was mentioned to me that sounds contradictory. Well, I said it was going to sound contradictory. It does sound contradictory. For to walk in harmony and unity in the body of Christ, and yet one of the mechanisms for maintaining harmony and unity is separating from us those who are bent on disharmony and disunity. Um, sounds like a contradiction, but actually it's not at all. It's just a part of the big picture, part of the process. So, <clears throat> first let me boil it down to you, personally. Each of you are at a different place. Some of you are young people. Some of you are young adults. Some of you are younger children. Some of you are a lot of your parents. Some of you are old fogies, I mean grandparents. So we're all from a different you know, place in life and process. And the thing that I want to present to you is this. You are not going to be able to have a doctrine that prevents conflict. But you and I need to take upon ourselves a manner of living that as much as lies within us attempts to live at peace with all men. And the passage that we read this morning in Acts is a startling picture of an attempt by the apostles and just because we don't have time in the shadow of Galatians chapter 2 where Paul was not willing to pervert the gospel for the sake of Christian brothers whose behavior had the potential for perverting the gospel that in that context and with those same exact men he refers to in Galatians he's here in Jerusalem and these men beseech him to take upon himself an expression of honoring his Jewish heritage. And he complies without a word recorded of, um, in a, of, of disapproval. He joined right in there. And it's plain that the fear of the leaders of Jerusalem was such that they were trying to avoid unnecessary conflict. And it's plain that the conflict was a genuine concern they had because the conflict broke out just when a, a Jewish believer from Asia saw him. That there's that scoundrel and started an uproar without even being bothered to attempt to process what Paul was doing concerning the vow. And of course, assuming that he just was being a, rep, a reckless reprobate. So the riot breaks out. So we have a picture. Here's Paul writing to the Romans, telling him about his visit to Jerusalem, asking for prayer. And on the way, if you remember the rest of the book of Acts, he gets these prophecies told him that he's going to have real severe problems in Jerusalem. And he does. And the rest of his life is affected by it. His whole ministry is changed and transformed by the, the conflict that erupts in Jerusalem. So <clears throat> we, we have questions to ask. And I, I have um, on the back of the notes, kind of the outline for the next section, the last section, on the back of it, I have a little, a little brief commentary. And I'm not trying to be impatient, but uh, the, the rest of that, the last segment of Romans um, does come out from this context of discussing conflict in the church. And, and I think it would be helpful for us to understand part of what Paul is trying to say in relationship to this, this command, this duty that we have to be careful with our liberties as we interact with others who may not have the same liberty. And I, I've written it there, you can kind of read it, I don't have it on the screen. <clears throat> There's a universal and continuing cultural or socio-political context in which the gospel is preached. And I think it's important that we recognize the gospel is a complex message to the world and it comes to the world in a complex fashion. 
And it's imperative that we understand that as the gospel's preached, there's a truth that's, that's unending, it's unchanging. There's a promise established by God that the Messiah is going to sit upon the throne of David and he's going to reign and rule on the earth in a political fashion for a thousand years. And that's been a promise from the Old Testament continuing on to this day. That particular promise is reigning and it has deep roots, and not only in Jewish theology, but also our practical understanding as Gentiles of our part and our participation in that. And so with that fundamental reality, there's this pressure that exists. And just reading back from my notes here, trying to keep me from going too long, the context that is that socio-political context. The context forms the basis for understanding and knowledge in the manner of preaching and living out the gospel and joy, hope, and peace. That means that if we're gonna walk as Christians in the world, we have to walk with a sensitivity so that our manner of life as others look upon us, so that our manner of life is speaking the truth of the gospel in a clear fashion so that the truth of the gospel is manifest without confusion or equivocation. In the socio-political context, you have that Jewish element and that Gentile element. Now, I understand that the nature of the Jewish and the Gentile element is somewhat changed substantially today from the time that Paul was having a riot in the temple back at the time of the writing. But that, but that context is still there. The context is still there. And let's look at the couple notes I have. The Jew has a specific heritage through Christ. And that's the confirmation of the promises made by God. Okay, so everything about being a Jew, all of the law, all of the prophets, all these things, some total point to one thing, Jesus shall reign. And this kingdom that the Jews have been looking for from time immemorial, this kingdom is coming. And he will reign. And so when we see elements of the gospel relating to that Jewish heritage, it's important that we understand that the fundamental promises of God, how they were made and how they were confirmed, Jesus fulfilled that and made those confirmations in his blood and by his resurrection, with which we have confidence to trust and believe he is the son of God, he is the son of David, he is coming again. Second point I have there is the Gentile has a specific heritage through Christ, glorifying God for his mercy. Now, okay, I'm taking this right from Romans chapter 15 for context, but that's a different point of reference, and we need to understand that that's a different point of reference. From the Jewish mindset, the righteousness of the law stands out. And the necessity of righteousness by the law stands out. But as Christ himself confirmed all those promises and confirmed all that righteousness, out from Christ went the mercy that whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so the mercy is that rallying point of the Gentile. It's important that we understand this, this has got a substantial socio-political impact because the Gentile doesn't come into the church with a sense of needing to accommodate nor participate in the Jewish heritage. That doesn't mean his entrance is there for a mockery or a, an abuse, but there's a distinction, a distinctiveness. So it's that, the tension between the Jewish culture 
and the Gentile culture that affects the gospel and how it's preached and how it's lived out, that tension exists in the church and it exists today in the same fashion. Excuse me, it exists today like it did before, not necessarily in exactly the same fashion, but certainly in substance. So when we're called to this rallying point of unity, there's a distinct understanding that, forgive me for a poor analogy, it's like water and oil. The Gentile mindset, because they're not being called to become Jews first and then be saved, or to be saved and then become Jews, because there's that keen distinction that's left intact, then there's this tension, especially from the Jewish side, of valuing their heritage and having a struggle with the manner in which the Gentiles were admitted and how they behave as Gentiles in the Church of Christ. So, so when we, we talk about these things, you know, I, I, I was tempted, I'm not going to do it, but I was tempted to go and read some of the passages of the ultimate error if the Judaizers have their way. I'll just simply say there's a significant portion of the written scripture that deals with that issue. Almost the entire book of Hebrews is devoted to that focal point. How the, how the Hebrews need to understand that the new covenant has replaced the old covenant and how it has done so. It's a significant spiritual reality. One of my favorite passages in Colossians as there's this call, this rallying call to preserving the truth of the gospel. So, here's the problem that I'm going to tell you about as we grow, grow through this. Maybe we'll first go through it and we'll be growing the rest of our life. The problem that we have is you and I have a sociocultural perspective and we're aware of the potential for tension and conflict. I mean, <laughs> that riot that occurred in Jerusalem when, he, when I opened up in chapter 14 and said, not to doubtful disputation, that riot is an extreme consequence of doubtful disputation. And I cannot say that it's Paul's fault. And I also can acknowledge that the attempt to mitigate some of that tension was not even visible to the crowd because there was so much deep-seated sociocultural prejudice and conflict. So as we push through this information, we will never come to the place that we can come up with a little jingle that says, okay, do these three things and we're fine. We can't come up with a context for attitude to process our attitude. And so at this point, <clears throat> As you see on the screen, there's, there's a bunch of questions that relate to what we've been covering in the last four or five weeks. And, you know, questions like, who's the weaker brother? And just because I might not get there today, put in parentheses. Look at Matthew 18, whole chapter. Why does he need to be received? Why does he need to be received? Uh, what is doubtful disputu disputation and is there an opposite? If, if we had continued, which we already did when we went through Acts, if we'd continued going through that account in Acts of Paul being arrested and trying to speak to the people, it's, a pl it's plain that he attempted to give a testimony, to give an account of his work in ministry of which he was being accused falsely that he was smashing down the Jewish traditions in the temple, etc. But the prejudice was so high that his attempt to clarify the issues simply caused a riot. And, you know, he ended up needing to appeal to Caesar just so that the, the issues of fact concerning himself as a citizen could be properly established, you know, as a citizen before Caesar. So, this isn't something that we're going to find 
uh, well, it's this and then it's only this and there's nothing else this, and we can not cut and dry, look through a matter, and we're not gonna get there. We're, we're always gonna be at a place of needing to have a manner of approach that springs from a heartfelt attitude, and that's the key. So, I am scared. Let's go ahead and do it. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8. This is one of the most beautiful sections of Scripture. It's just absolutely, I want to say gorgeous, but that's probably a dumb word to use. It gives me a sense of beauty in my soul as I read it. And there's, there's two slides here, this one and the next one. Questions from eight to 10 guidelines. And knowing the, the shortness of time that I have to speak, <clears throat> what I would like to do is I want to just start with this one opening sentence. Now, is touching things offered to idols? Okay, do you remember the context of Acts 21, which we just read? As Paul is being told by the leadership in Jerusalem that he's being accused of having an animus against the law and against the temple, so that he's tearing it down instead of respecting it. He's, you know, maybe it was Peter. Maybe it was out of the sensitivity of his Galatians 1 experience with, with Peter, with, with Paul. But I, I, I want you to see socio-political context. The things Paul said in Galatia, in Asia, in fact, that, that very incident may be the firebrand that came back and incited Jerusalem with this animus. But the context of the socio-political presentation of the gospel in Asia was different, and now Paul was in Jerusalem, and the apostles appealed to him concerning the socio-political structure of the city. And they say, we have many believers here who are zealous for the law. Now, he didn't say we have many Jews here who are zealous for the law. We have many believers here. And so there's this, this zealousness that was projecting erroneous information about Paul, and they were pressing him into this you know, sensitivity to the socio-political arena that Paul was in, and he submitted to that, which I believe, in accordance with his own teaching that he gave in, here in Romans 14. But as that presentation goes forth, remember what they said? Now, we've already said about the Gentiles. We've, we've already established that you know, they need to not eat things sacrificed to idols, things strangled and, and void fornication. They just give that little handful of things. And so we, 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 we see this discussion here. And it's really an interesting discussion. Every Sunday, we have communion. We have the Lord's Supper. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the, the number one single expression that the Lord's Supper brings to us is not only a reminder of the death of Christ, but it's the commonality, it's the community, it's the communion of the saints that's established by the death of Christ. And how we're one of another. And when you go from chapter eight to the end of chapter 10, if you're reading carelessly, you're, you could accuse Paul of simply saying one thing and then saying the very opposite next to it. So we have to recognize that there's one mindset. Look at what he says here. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. Love edifies. So he starts this whole discussion from a frame of reference that you can enter a discussion with that tension so readily brought to the table of doubtful disputation. When you examine the scriptures, there's a lot of scripture that speaks against this doubtful disputation, these arguments that we have to press our point and make sure that our point is secure in the light of 
the circumstance and the standing that we're in. We, we need to defend the gospel, and therefore we need to have every skill of spirit to be devoid of the personalized position that we're trying to promote, that sectarian, divisive struggle that is so natural to man. Now, <laughs> I just want you to think about this. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. There's a teeter-totter right here. Back in Romans 14, we're talking about love. The whole, the whole manner which we get through this discussion is based on love. And it's easy and natural to segue out of love into knowledge and walk in pride and speak our point, get our point of view established, and be right and cause division and cause spiritual harm to the church. So look at verse 2 as he continues on. If any man thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Now here's the problem that we face on the earth. Every day you and I exist in this temporary, this weak, this temporal. I shouldn't have said temporary, I just should have said temporal. We, we, we live with weakness and we live with the limitation of time and we're also limited in that capacity which with we've been created. So the problem with knowledge and the problem with this, this vain argumentation that goes on, this, this doubtful disputation that takes place, the problem with that is it's knowledge based and basically what he's simply saying is this, I don't care how much knowledge you have, you might be the greatest theologian who ever walked the face of the earth. And I want to tell you, Mr. Theologian, when you compare your knowledge to God's, you're an idiot. You don't know anything. That's a big come down. But I'll tell you, we have got to walk in humility and that's, so you, you have a viewpoint based upon reams of argumentation, fine. You don't know a thing. You don't know anything like you ought to know. So I want you to understand that pride bases argumentations on knowledge, fights it out, dukes it out, and ends up with a product so short of the full counsel of God. Because it's simply man's expression of his limited knowledge. But now put that in the context. Look at the next verse. Look at the context shift. And this is what we're called to, this powerful shift. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. What an incredible statement. You rely on your knowledge and your intellect and your argumentation. You're simply arguing from this tiny thimble full of understanding and knowledge that you have. And you don't know anything as you ought to know. You step into the place where we walk in the love of God, pure, proper, godly love, not, not fleshly, sinful love, just the love of God. All of a sudden, we bring eternity right into the mix. And bringing eternity into the mix, we bring God into the mix, and we're known of God. And all of a sudden, the knowledge of God affects us in that instant. Now, I'm going to give an illustration. This actually happened to me. It's one of those really sore spots of sadness, and yet God redeemed it. I was a teacher at a Christian school, fundamentalist Baptist school at that, and small classes. But this one class I had, my biology class, they had a lot of preacher's kids in it. And they were firebrands. Firebrands for the gospel, firebrands for... So one day during biology class, now ask me, biology class? Sounds like Bible class. I don't understand. In the middle of biology class, they interrupted the lecture at hand and said, Mr. Cox, now they knew I was Catholic by background and was saved. Mr. Cox, um, can you tell so and so, we had a student come to our school who was Roman Catholic background. She was not born again. And the kids apparently 
have been using their free time to convert her. Now they were doing it in typical fashion of hammering her, hammering her with the truth. So we had a little discussion and I don't know whose fault it was, I'll take the blame. We had this really stupid idea, let's have a debate. I know it was really stupid, forgive me. <laughs> so we leave the classroom, we go over to the church and we set the guidelines for debate. And each side was going to present their view of salvation. Now you have to understand, these Baptist preachers kids, they loved the Lord, they knew the scripture, and they were jackhammer ready. <laughs> and this poor dear girl, Catholic background, you don't have much biblical knowledge. So they start presenting and after they present, she rushes to me and says, Mr. Cox, can you tell me any scriptures that say this or that? And she was just looking, scrambling for some kind of a, a dis, you know, point of discussion. Anyway, she was obliterated. If anybody could ever be humanly obliterated, she was obliterated. And here's what happened to her. As she was obliterated with knowledge, we didn't know this, we weren't trying to do this on purpose, but there was no love in it. There was just the puffed up self-righteousness of knowing the truth and proving to somebody the depth of the error of their ways. The girl fled from the arena, the scene, and, and went up into a remote place and just sat by herself and hunkered down. And I knew, you have really blown it. You have really blown it. So we had another teacher on campus who was also Catholic by background, but she was a female. Well, I guess she would be a female, wouldn't she? <laughs> and so I go rushing out looking for this teacher. And I confessed our sin. And I said, this poor girl needs to be reached out to. She's at real risk. So this other teacher, I, I think I stood there because I remember all the details. I must have been there. So the teacher stands there and this girl unloads. And you know what she unloads about? What's absolutely true. The pride, arrogant slamming of the person to prove a spiritual point. She didn't have the knowledge. The Christian kids had the knowledge. But she was deeply wounded by the arrogance and the puffed up pride of presenting that knowledge just simply to annihilate her position. So she had to tell her side of the story. As I'm listening, it's like, who was the teacher that was in charge of that class? <laughs> I was ashamed to no end. And so the, the teacher listens carefully to her and she figures out the hinge pin of the gospel in these kind of situations, the social culture dynamic. She said to her, I understand, honey. Can I just ask you a question? Do you have peace and joy in your heart? Is Jesus near to you? That's all she needed to hear. She burst into tears sobbing, and the teacher so tenderly led her to Christ. And she was converted by the love of Christ. And it's important that we understand something, okay? This is not a small matter. I've been in Christian circles a very long time. I got so irritable, I mean irritated, well I get irritable too, but I got so irritated and frustrated sitting there at lunch in Bible college, sitting with the seminarians and listening to them wax eloquent and ream on and on. And it's all just about their knowledge and their understanding and constructing a cultural church out of the arrogance of knowledge. It's so full of hypocrisy. It is absolutely a crime against heaven and against man. 
So, so we really, really, now I, I admit, okay, I've participated and I have the same struggle. I'm not, I'm not separate. I already gave a good illustration of my own failing, my own fault. But it's important that we understand that when you and I enter the mix of a situation, we have two choices. We can be small and temporal and ineffective because we rely on our knowledge, our understanding, and our position, and our views, and our deep understanding of Scripture. We can be small, or we can bring the eternal God himself into the mix. When we were at that place where we reached out to this girl, I was desperate. I'd been praying, God, we have so messed up. Can you rescue us? And God came in his eternal spirit through the vehicle of love. And he won a soul in the midst of a really awkward moment that we created. It was a delightful thing. We as a class went out and bought her a $55 brand new Schofield Bible, leather bound Bible. <laughs> and, and we loved her dearly and it was, it was wonderful the rest of the year, the reality of walking in Christ. And I hope I learned a little bit of a lesson someone in charge in terms of responsibility. But let's, let's um, look at verse 4. It's concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered sacrifice to idols. We know the idol is nothing in the world and that there's none other God but one. So he's, he's, he's reading out a factual reality. Now, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of liberty here with the larger context of Scripture, but when we just read in Acts 21 about how there's a command not to eat things sacrificed to idols, and when you listen to this discussion here about things sacrificed to idols, Paul has an incredible approach to handling the concept of eating things sacrificed to idols. And his first preposition, excuse me, proposition here is we know that an idol is nothing in the world. <clears throat> it's an extremely imperative statement for us to understand. There's that idol in the temple made of brass or gold or wood or whatever. And it's nothing. It's nothing. And so as he goes on, that, mind you, the, the whole discussion of 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, the whole discussion centers around eating things sacrificed to idols which was one of those things the apostle said, you don't do. You don't eat things sacrificed to idols. And so there's a context in which Paul is trying to explain how you manage that exhortation. But as he goes on, will you, will you skip with me to chapter 10? So he goes through all this incredible teaching. And he gets into the Lord's Supper. And he says, verse 18. Well, let's start with, let, let's go ahead and keep the context of the Lord's Supper. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ. So he's speaking there of our collective gathering and when we break the bread and drink the cup that we're sharing in common that spiritual reality that we're all redeemed and we're all one by the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. And there's that communion in those things. Now, now watch that turnstile of communion tilt here. Verse 18, Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they with each of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then? Listen very careful. The idol, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Okay, we already know, he's already said chapter 8, idol is nothing. We know knowledge. Now listen to how he clarifies that truth 
through the window of love. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would that you have no communion or fellowship with the devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker to the Lord table and the table of devils. Do we, provoke the, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now it gets into a wrap-up point, and I, I, I want to say a pass before I continue on. Do you see the distinction that's being made? He's identifying a loving understanding culturally, socioculturally, he's understanding what's going on in somebody else's life. And he's saying that we pay attention to that issue. What the spiritual sinful battle in another person's life is, is the thing that we're focused on in terms of our ministry and in terms of our care. So that the manner in which we express our liberty has a great potential for being that which causes the trigger the offense, the scandal, where somebody else's conscience embraces the demons, embraces that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's the trigger. That's the only thing Paul's been talking about from the very first word till this very present expression of it. Now, let's look at it a little more closely. <clears throat> We don't have time to go through everything. I've got all the questions that kind of help you think it through and I advise you to go through as a family and discuss it and read it. So let's go back to chapter 8 really quickly. Verse 5 says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, howbeit there is not in every one of man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing sacrificed unto an idol. That's what he was referring to in chapter 10. Their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat, in this case, the liberty gained by knowledge of understanding that the, that the meat sacrificed to idols is nothing, but meat, our liberty, commends us not to God. For neither if we eat, are we better? Or if we do not eat, are we the worst? That's an imperative we need to understand. And this is going to get us to the high ground. <clears throat> so when we talk about liberties, things that we have by way of liberty, we're not talking about things that have importance. Whether you do or not is it's nothing. It's meaningless. It's not the core. It's not the spiritual reality. So. That being the backdrop, Paul does something that really spins a curve. And let's, let's just continue reading it through and I'll try to push through. Just so you remember, I didn't start till 25 after, just in case you think I'm going way too long. Verse 9, take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So you have to ask the question, what is he talking about? How does your liberty become a stumbling block to those that are weak? And it's simply this, that when you engage and use your liberty in such a fashion that the one with the tender conscience is driven to sin, to violate the conscience because he's got a conscience about it, that's where the offense is. That's the target. When we're in the process of learning to walk in love, we're thinking about how my behavior might impact. So he goes on, verse 10, this is how he, now I, I want you to understand that this is like, it should be case one on my list. This is like an example, a case that Paul is creating to illustrate the how we, how we use our liberty in the light of other people's 
scruples. Verse 10, for if a man see you that has knowledge, okay, you've got this liberty, you know it's nothing, sit at meat in an idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. So that's where the conscience issue is troubled. Your liberty and your confidence in your liberty pushes me to mimic your liberty instead of resolving like we were commanded in Romans 14 to be fully persuaded in our own heart instead of resolving. Paul's already spelled it out, I jumped ahead to Romans 10, so, I mean 1 Corinthians 10 so you could see it. Knowledge tells me this is nothing. This is absolutely nothing. But understanding and love tells me those people don't understand that it's nothing. So to them it's something. This is about demons. This is about worshiping demons. And so my liberal expression of knowledge has the capacity to cause someone else to sin simply by their observation that my free use of that liberty provokes them to do the same without having resolved the conscience issue towards God. That's why Paul said, for whatever's not of faith is sin. And so you, you have got to walk in faith. You've got to walk according to that which is conscience before God, right and wrong. So then he goes on and says, though, so, verse 11, by thy knowledge, weak brother, perish for whom Christ died. Okay? I put somebody else in a spiritual spin because I'm thoughtless and reckless in how I portray my liberty in front of them. Now, that's the simple teaching of Scripture. And Paul is giving one little example. So as he pushes on, he tries to give a little more clarification. Verse 12, but when you sin, okay, so here's you using by your knowledge the liberty that you have freely by faith in your heart. You're using that knowledge openly in front of someone whose consequences provoke provocative against their conscience. So they sin, and now you have sinned. When you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So this, this, this is a throwback to Romans 14 when he said, uh, there's this thing here of standard. Every man's conscience has to stand before God. Not before you or me. And when I'm reckless with my liberty so that I impress or I penetrate your space and I use my liberty in front of you in a way and the provocation of that is for you to feel obligated to also take up the behavior of that liberty without having resolved the conscience issue for you. I've sinned against you I've caused you to sin, but in the process, I've sinned against Christ. And so a standard is raised in your, among the Christian brethren. When I'm in a commune, a community, and I have knowledge that other people do not have knowledge over, the standard is, how do I offend Christ in this matter? And I offend Christ in a matter by putting myself and my liberty in such a position in front of them that they feel the pressure to conform to my liberty and they sin against their conscience before Christ. When I enter into any kind of community or relationship, my obligation is to think of Christ's objective in that person's life and preserve the integrity of their conscience so that they might come to the knowledge of the faith. <clears throat> I was going to give you another illustration, but I'll, maybe I'll wait. <clears throat> Verse 13, 
Wherefore, if meat makes my brother to offend, I'm just going to keep on eating meat because that's what my liberty says. That's what the scripture says, right? If I, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. So when I'm in a relationship with you, I need to be sensitive to what we might generally call the socio-political reality, the world we live in. And in that relationship with you, my objective isn't for you to see me enjoying my liberties. My objective is that any behavior that I have toward you might provoke you towards faith in God, towards faith in Christ, and answering your conscience before him. Now, I realize there are a gazillion little what is, but what is, and I, I recognize that. Now, I want us to notice here how Paul switches the channel. So, it's like he really avoids a legalistic argument by the next thing that he shares. <laughs> microphone for David Summers. While well, he's getting the microphone fired up. It's not important that people who have different views than you understand why you have your views. What's important is that you have an understanding of how you might impact somebody so that they press into Christ or whether you're causing them to press and follow your example. David. Thank you. Um, the Lord used this to bring a clarity for me that I don't think I had uh, before about this. Um, lately, the Lord's been just, you know, wanting me to just come from reality because Jesus is truth, and when we're coming from that, and in terms of what I what I see is there's a situation where, if first off, the Jewish tradition was you would bring your offerings to the Lord God, and even like Hannah would go up every year and there'd be this, this abundance of food because there'd be extra food from the sacrifices. And so it was all part of the worship. It was a worshiping Jehovah and, and it was part of that culture. And so what happens is if, for example, Paul goes to somebody's house and it turns out that meat that had been offered in a sacrifice to devils the idols that was sold by somebody to somebody else who then sold it to somebody else and then say the wife of that house goes and buys the food and brings it to Paul there's no awareness that this food was offered to idols this was just food and it's not like the reality is well there's poison in this stuff that if I eat this this is going to be you know bad or Anything is associated spiritual. There's this, it's, God has provided for Paul through this household and he goes in and he knows the reality is that's fine. Because of the socioeconomic, that, what you're talking about, that context. So that's one situation. But if you go someplace and they say, just as you're about to put it into your mouth, well, you know, that was offered to idols. You go. Forget it. I'll starve before I eat this stuff. Because number one, the context of it was this stuff was in part of the communion of worshiping this, and I don't want any part of it. And it's number one that it's not that you look at it and say, if I eat it, I'm going to get, you know, whacked out or I'm going to get poisoned or anything. But it's that context, and you just manifest that to somebody else who is looking at you, saying, hey, hey, by the way, this is, you just, immediately, you have no communion with that. And an analogy, or similar to like today's, it's like, say for example, you get a, you're a, you're a 501c organization, and say, somebody comes and 
gives you money. Say, they say, here's $1,000 for your ministry. Well, you take that money and say, well, praise God, thank you, Lord, I've been praying, I need, and you move up. But if they come and they say, well, here's $1,000 for you, but I just want you to know that organized crime, i.e. maybe the mafia, got this money and wants to give it to you. You go, get it away. I don't want a part of that thing. You couldn't force me to take that money because of the association of all of that. It's not that the dollar bills are going to come in and there's, oh, here, isn't this a little spot of blood on one of them? No, it's nothing inherent in, in the thing itself. But the reality is, in that content, there's a conscious issue, and, and that's where conscious comes in. So it seems so clear to me how you view these kind of things based on what you've been sharing. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you. So. <clears throat> I realize now we're at the one hour mark, so I need to try to wrap it up. But look at chapter nine, and I just want to basically tell you about chapter nine. Paul starts out saying, I'm not an apostle. Now what you might remember is Paul is very sensitive about his apostleship because he had a lot, especially in Corinth, of negative press whereby people were trying to simply say he has no standing in the ministry in Corinth. So this is just one of those little points of him acknowledging his apostleship. But then he, he brings up this really interesting thing. He says, I'm an apostle. Have I not seen the Lord? So he gives his evidence for being an apostle. And then he continues on. Verse 4, do I not have power to eat and drink? Now that means authority. Do I not have a right to eat and drink? Do I not have authority or power to lead about a wife, as the other apostles do? It's a great verse to prove that all the apostles except Paul were married. Or let's, that's, we can at least make a close assumption of that. Or is Barnabas and I the only ones that have no power to forbear working? So the other apostles were also living off of the gospel and they weren't working with their hands. So he goes, he continues on. And what he, what he does is an amazing thing. And this, and this is where you and I, we may never solve the church's dilemma in how we resolve this conflict between the liberties and those who might be like the Jewish believers who would pervert the gospel and oppress everybody to keeping the law. Those are the, those are the two extremes of potential. We might never be able to solve that problem, but you know what? You can walk in liberty yourself. You can walk in such a way that you'll never be the cause of an offense. And that's the objective. So what Paul's actually saying He's moving now from the structural context of sensitivities to a grade higher, a level higher of sensitivity. And he basically says this, a long and the short of it is, there are a lot of rights that I have as an apostle. And I have voluntarily set aside those rights for the purpose of reaching those people that I want to reach for the gospel. And then he has this little twist to it. He basically says, if I obey the calling that I have and I preach the gospel, what reward do I have? Nothing. I've just done what I'm supposed to do. God equipped me to preach the gospel. I preach the gospel, so what? I just did what I was supposed to do. But he said, and here's, and here's where the high ground comes in, but if I do it at my own cost, I have something of this sacrificial gift to give back to God. And so what Paul is trying to do at this point, I mean, he spends a long time talking about his apostleship and the liberty that he makes. And in the process, I'll read a couple more of the verses, how he lives. But it's imperative that we understand you can avoid ever finding yourself in the place of controversy when you take upon yourself the goal that my Christian life isn't about me using my liberties because my liberties don't commend me to God. If I use my liberties, there's no commendation. But when I, for Christ's sake in the Gospels, I abstain from my liberties for the sake of others, I have something as a sacrifice, I'm, I'm partaking in a share of the suffering of Christ so that the gospel might go forth. So 
He continues on, and if I, uh, please forgive me, I can't read the whole section. <clears throat> I want to read verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory, for necessity is laid on me, and woe be if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Still got to do it. What is my reward then? Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel without charge. And I abuse not my power in the gospel. So here's a, here's a sensitivity. Now we all know the stories about preachers and radio preachers that have abused their place and their privilege. We've all heard of accounts and stories. And it's so easy to find yourself in a place of prominence because of the blessing of God on your ministry. God gives you a prominent ministry, it's easy. And so Paul is simply taking extra precaution that was not required. The other apostles did not do this. But he was alert to the fact that his own sacrificial functioning in the gospel made opportunity for the gospel to go farther and wider and that he get a reward because he's not abusing his power. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, okay, see his liberty? Though I be free from all men, my conscience is before God, period. Yet, I have made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. And that's the high ground. You want to solve this problem in the body of Christ? That's your solution. Emphasize your liberty, and you might simply be an occasion of sin. But even if you're not an occasion of sin, exercising your liberty doesn't commend you to God. Fine. You're, you're living without evil conscience and doing that. So that's great. But the reality is, I place myself under as a servant that I might gain. Now look at how he brings that to pass in terms of clarification. Verse 20, to the Jews. I became as a Jew. We saw that today in Acts 21. That I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, under the law, that I might gain them under the law. Verse 21, to them without law, not being without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain those that are without law. To the weak I became as weak, to the, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men so that I might by all means save some. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Now look at the challenge. This is end of life snapshot. What's going to happen when you get that crown? Know you not that they which run a race run all, but only one receives the prize run so that you may obtain. Every man strives for mastery is temperate in all things. They do it to, to obtain a corruptible crown. We an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as beating the air, but I keep my body under, and I bring it in subjection, self-discipline, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's imperative that we recognize that in the very end of our life, when life is measured, <coughs> and rewards are passed out. There's, there's going to be reward for that cost that we endured so the gospel could go forward, could, so the gospel could go out. I, I, I have no more time, so I have to stop. But if we continued on reading through chapter 10, we would simply understand that first, well, let's, let's just read the final verses because I can at least read those. <coughs> If any man say to you, verse 28, this is sacrifice to idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but the other. For why is your liberty judged by another man's conscience? For if I by grace be partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whereof, whether, excuse me, wherefore, whether, they, excuse me, whether you therefore eat 
or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving no offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Brothers, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So we have to learn to get along in these places of scruples. So much other information to go through in terms of process. But today, we, I guess we couldn't get past the first step. The first step is, what's your attitude? If your attitude is the confidence of your liberty based on your knowledge and the defense of that in such a fashion so as nobody might ever keep you from walking out your liberty, if that's your attitude, you're of that disposition that causes conflict, doubtful disputations. You're going to enter into the battle over the issue. What does, it, what does it mean? It says it here and also Romans. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Why does it say that? When your conscience is right before God, you have that liberty before God. But there are times, like I call it this, the swiney times. There are times when other people who have no capacity, they're just like unable to understand precious pearls of your faith. You don't expose it to them. You don't look for those who are incapable of rejoicing with you and Christ in the fashion which you have. You, and you don't need that. That's not the heritage of your gospel. That other people have to acknowledge you and your liberties. So, how do we live? I feel horrible. It's time to quit and only begun. We do have the parenting session afterwards. I will be here for that if there's any discussion that we'd like to pursue more practically. And I did call this part one in honesty, imagining that there'd be some potential to go through some of those cases. Um, look ahead. I'm going to try and go through Galatians a little bit. I'm going to try and go through, um, what's the next slide? Um, Matthew 18. I have these questions that I'm asking. They're questions right out of the passage. And they relate to this whole process of discussion. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, <clears throat> let it be that we, your children, who are satisfied by the love of Christ, might be so filled with the desire to shed that love abroad wherever you send us, that we might be a gracious people that it might be full of goodness, ready to reach out in love and truth for Christ's sake and the gospel. And let it be our, our testimony, Lord, that there be something that which we have full gracious liberty before you, but the risk of observing that has the potential for causing others to sin. I almost have a happy approach that Paul declared that I will never ever use that liberty as long as this natural world stands. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.